This is the International Rice Research Institute. Sits just outside of Manila. It's a fascinating research institute. They have 70,000 strands of DNA of rice in their freezer. It's amazing. Yeah, and so their task is to really preserve and optimize rice for the poorest farmers in the world. And so they also sit on a lot of data and make use of that data to sort of make advice for those farmers. And so one of the things that they did was to build a digital system that, uh, given the input, would give farmers the advice about how much fertilizer to buy and when to apply it. And they built this as a web-based system. Nobody used it. And why? Because these poor farmers in Southeast Asia, they don't have computers. They don't have smartphones. Our whole illusion that we would bring the internet to the poorest capabilities of the world through a smartphone is an illusion. These people can't type. They can't read. If you're lucky, they can read. They definitely cannot write. And if you ever try to, to write in their languages on your smartphone, it's a nightmare. So they don't have smartphones. If you're lucky, they have one phone in the village. And that's it. So what the research institute did was actually change this to put a voice system in front of it. So now the farmer can go to this one, fo one phone in the village, um, dial in, uh, select one of 27 different uh, dialects, and describe his patch of land, and then machine learning goes off and comes back with advice that says, this is how much you should buy, this is when you should apply it. Apparently, that advice delivers double the crop yield at only 10% uh, of the uh, fertilizer used. And it's a very successful system. What is the success of this system? Is actually putting a voice interface in front of it. And, and why is that? It's because we all talk. We all talk all the time. Voice is such a natural interface for us to access each other. Yeah, remember, this is not a Slack channel. Yeah, I'm actually talking to you. You are listening. And so voice actually unlocks digital systems for everyone because everyone knows how to use his or her voice. Yeah, and if you, uh, we do this all the time. Yeah, this is our normal way of communicating. And if you think about the interfaces that we've built to our digital systems, they've all been driven by the machines, not by the humans. Green character terminals, uh, web-based systems, phones, the cards on your phones. It's all about screen, keyboard, mouse or your finger, or whatever you want to call it. It's all the same. It's all driven by the capabilities of the machine, not about how we as humans would like to communicate. Because we really use our voice for almost everything that we do. Um, but I do I pick this example. I think if you talk to any other search engine, they will tell you that there is a massive explosion in the use of voice in terms of accessing search engines. And especially in the case of Baidu and a number of other uh, you know, um, non-English-based uh, search engines, for them, input in foreign languages is a nightmare. And the search using voice is such a natural way of accessing digital information. And you know, we've seen this already with the rise, it's not just of Alexa, which is sort of the voice system that sits behind the echo that you may have at, at home, uh, but Lex and Polly, which are sort of our, our basic components that the cloud division of AWS de de delivers, um, which can integrate into any device and any system that you have. You don't want the surgeon to take your hand, his or her hands off you yeah, to access some machinery, if you can do that by voice. Yeah, and if you're at home and you're a young parent and your kid is on your arm and it's ill, it's screaming, you don't want to go to a form at WebMD and fill it out. You want to scream at that device. And you want to get calm advice back. Yeah? And, and my favorite one is, and I think everybody that has one of these uh, home uh, assistants has, uh, if you're standing in your kitchen, you do not want to take clean your hands first before you have to figure out how many milliliters go into a cup, which is, if you're a European, something that even after 25 years, I don't know. <laughs> and 
the ability is, of course, to extend all of this. One of the great things we've done, Don, I think, with, with Alexa, is to turn it into a platform, a platform that anybody else can extend. And whether you want to do this, say, uh, Alexa, ask Uber to send me a car to the IAC building. Yeah, or with WebMD, or play games, or anything that you can do. And we see a massive innovation spurt happening because now suddenly anybody can extend these, these voice interfaces where we take care of the hard work around it, which is, uh, you know, I don't mean a speech recognition, natural language understanding. And I think actually it's not just about voice. Yeah, we can make all of our environment active. And I take this example of, I don't know if you've seen these internet-enabled toothbrushes. So what you have to do is you're basically brushing your teeth and you have to look at your smartphone at the same time whether you're actually brushing white or not. I'm pretty sure there are better feedback mechanisms than, than that. If you, are, if you have a smart home full of electricity, yeah, you measure all your electricity, you set yourself goals. If you have to look at the graph on your cell phone to determine whether or not you're meeting your goals or not, it's too late. What if you have a clock on the wall that actually, when you're meeting your goals, it's green, and actually when you're violating your goals because someone just put on the hairdryer, it turns red. That changes behavior. Yeah, really being able to glance at something. So our whole environment, it's not just voice, our whole environment will become a target for output for actuators, for actually giving information and changing behavior. So it's not just about voice. This is all about making human-centric interfaces in the way that we as humans like to interact. We, if you have to look at your phone how late it is, and I know we all do that, but looking at the clock on the wall, you glance for a microsecond and you know how late it is. That's a human way of actually accessing information. And so it's not just at home. I think we've uh, built a system where we started looking at how would voice work in business, in the enterprise. And it turns out there are so many cases where voice is the ideal interface. If you've ever walked into a conference room yeah, where you actually have to plug in your laptop to get everything to work, to call in the other folks, why not just walk in there and say, hey, Alexa, start a meeting? and it will figure out what all the other people have to connect to, what kind of things we have to be brought into the room, lower the blinds, dim the lights, all these kind of things through voice. Once you have a voice-enabled conference room, it's totally addictive, just like at home. You no longer want to pull out your phone at home where you actually can ask for the same information. And so Alexa for Business has three major components. Yeah, one of them is the ability for a business to manage all of these devices that they have throughout the whole organization. Yeah. Um, secondly, the ability to build what's called private skills. What we saw immediately when we launched this was the first thing that organizations started to do have simple Q&As, like, hey Alexa, till when is the cafeteria open? Hey Alexa, drop a note to the help desk. All of these kind of things where businesses were making private skills to actually that really only work for that particular organization. Or actually the access to the enterprise systems. Hey Alexa, tell me what big deals closed yesterday. Yeah, or what's our inventory? All of these access is built by, often by these organizations themselves, Salesforce and others, but many of them are actually sort of adapted specifically for um, that particular organization. And interesting is that this same system can not only be applied to businesses. Yeah, for example, in the hospitality world, there's tremendous interest in putting voice systems into every hotel room. So basically, you walk into your hotel room, and you can say, hey, Alexa, lower the blinds, set the temperature to, to this, uh, connect to the concierge, uh, do this on the TV. You know, all of these things where you needed five different uh, remote controls for, all suddenly are folded into one unified voice interface. The cool thing is with this is that it allows the individuals also to bring their home Alexa into this. Basically, then, in your hotel room, you have all the private skills that the hotel gives you, and it combines you with the skills that you have enabled for yourself at home for that particular period that you're in that hotel room. It's very powerful there. So with all of this, 
the key is that we need to start building human-centric interfaces to all the digital systems that we have. If you've ever given an iPad to your uh, grandmother, you know that the only thing she does with it is hit the Skype button. However, if she could talk to it, that will be something very different. It suddenly unlocks all the digital systems that we've built for ourselves, for us as digital natives, for everybody else to use. And I think that's the power of what voice brings you. There's a great uh, article in The Atlantic, um, was it about uh, a few weeks ago, that describes the whole story about uh, someone that has been blind, legally blind for a very long period of time. And basically, none of the digital systems that we've built apply, could be used by this individual. Putting a voice system on it suddenly unlocks the whole digital world for anybody that's blind. And I want to close it off with this one. This is a, a blog post I found from someone who is chronicling uh, his, uh, let's say, deterioration because of dementia. And there was this very motivating story where this individual suddenly discovers Alexa or the Echo and is so happy with it because one of the things that he knows is that he asks his caregivers the same thing over and over again every day, multiple times a day, and he can see the irritation in their, in their faces. However, Alexa, he can ask her 20 times, what is the day today? And she never, she always gives the right answer, and she never gets annoyed. So with that, you know, I truly believe that voice represents the next major disruption in, computers, in computing, because we have to start building our digital systems with voice first, because this is going to be the interface to our digital systems, because it is a natural human interface. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. That was fascinating. Good. Nice. Hi. So um, can you maybe explain why has technology until now had such a hard time really uh, processing real human conversation? All of these interfaces were built for a reason, right? And yeah, I think there is a... First of all, I think the whole history, of course, is that you know, computing started off with screens and things like that. But uh, I think this the past four or five years, uh, we've made major advances in, in two areas. One is hardware, uh, the kind of uh, hardware that is really needed to do deep learning and machine learning at neck-breaking speeds. So massive parallel memories, new GPUs, things like that. Um, and the software systems on top of those. That, that's both of them sort of evolved in parallel with each other. TensorFlow, CAFE, MXNet, yeah. those kind of systems allowed suddenly allowed us to build systems that could operate or do these things in real time. So for example, natural language understanding and automatic speech recognition are both computer science areas that have been around for 25, 30 right. years. Yeah? But we could never do them in real time. And, and I don't know if you, if you ever listened to the stories, the early days of Alexa when, when the first Echoes were released. The Echoes were actually released quite later than we had hoped. Mm -hmm because we really needed to make sure that these conversations were natural. Yeah, if you need to get a response back within a second, because if it takes two seconds or three seconds, you start figuring out uh, that's a computer. Yeah, right. it's, not a, it's not a conversation human. So that's, that's one thing. I, I think it is still day one in all of this, how to really do conversations, how to keep context, how to understand really what uh, where maybe over time a conversation goes on. We're, we're releasing a number of new features uh, around Alexa. One of them is memory, sort of basically say, uh, remember that I talked to Rebecca yeah. uh, at DLD and then maybe I will mention, I'll, I'll read an article by you and I'll, I'll ask Alexa to remember that. And then at one moment they can say, tell me, what is it that I know about Rebecca? Right. And it will come back with sort of that kind of information. Or context, where you say, um, you know, where I start a conversation with Alexa and where later on she knows that a command was in the context of a previous one. Um, so all of these kind of things are challenging because we've never done these things at scale. And so a lot of research is still necessary to really go into making conversational interfaces to our digital systems. 
so one, one challenge, sorry, mm -hmm. I forgot. One challenge still is that most of our digital systems today have been built for page-based output. Okay. Yeah, and as such, most of the skills that you see are sort of still at the level of then interacting with a page-based system behind that. And we see slowly the building of, of new sort of digital systems that have indeed this conversational interface as a primary one. Mm -hmm. So we're all completely ready for an improvement to the modern conference call. The access codes, the dial-ins, you know, all of this stuff. But I have to say that the predictions of video and you know, all these advancements have been out there for a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, what obstacles are in the way of, of, of voice really happening in the work environment? In the work environment. So I think there's, there's two parts. I think the conference room is actually a relatively easy one because it's a shared access space. There's a limited number of things that you would want to do there. So discovery of new skills, for example, is not necessarily okay. something, or you can put them on the screen where people walk into the conference room. Um, and, and I think most organizations have sort of settled on using one conference system. It's either Polycom or it's Cisco or it is Chime. Uh, and, and as such, the deep integration with those is, is easier to, to do. Um, you know, it still doesn't solve the problem of why is printing so hard? Right. Yeah? <laughs> I mean, after 50 years of computing and we still can't get printers to work, yeah. I think that one is something that we probably won't solve with voice. <laughs> uh, I think the other part is, of course, the um, the voice access in your office itself, you know, uh, identifying the right users, the capabilities, how, what are they allowed mm -hmm. to access, and things like that. I think there's a lot of work still to be done mm -hmm. there. What about privacy concerns? I mean, there's been privacy concerns raised about Alexa at home. It seems like you bring it to work, and that concern goes up manifold. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I think... Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of myths around this whole story. Yeah? I think, first of all, we've built into the hardware the ability to, for people to really see what the device is actually doing. First of all, mm -hmm. the device has no local storage capabilities. Yeah? It is hardwired to listen for the wake word, and it doesn't record anything until the wake word is actually being, being used. And then when anything goes over the, the wire, because all the brains of Alexa sit in the cloud, you'll see this blue light coming on. And so we've basically hardwired any network traffic with that blue light. Mm -hmm. So you as an individual know exactly when things go over the wire. And um, we built a hardware button into it to sort of disable listening to the wake word. And that's not a software button, that is really a hardware button. You push that one and actually the microphones are disabled through hardware. Uh, so we've given everyone the capabilities to really understand when it's being used, how it's being used, and what actually goes over the wire. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea is that you, know, that you can be assured that we're not collecting any data of you, that you, be sh that you do not allow us to collect mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. Can you, uh, uh, your job is to see the future, to plan for the cloud and, 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 and where technology is heading. How does AI um, and the advent of AI in enterprise and work and, and, and the world, how does it, you know, maybe you could just talk about where sure. you see this and how it's going to affect cloud, um, you know, in the next few years. So, so first and foremost, I think, you know, there's a lot of scaremongering among a AI. I think the, the current state of where we are with AI is very much machine learning and deep learning, where deep learning is one particular subset of machine learning. And basically what machine learning is, is taking data from the past to make predictions about the future. Mm -hmm. So uh, at Amazon, we've been doing this for the last 20, 25 years. Uh, and anybody that's been an Amazon customer, retail customer, has been exposed to machine learning. You just don't know it. Yeah, recommendations, similarities, other products to look at, all these kind of things are machine learning. It's not that we had an individual code these things. No, we had machinery figuring this out from the data that we have. Um, Amazon sits on billions of orders. Of course we make use of these billions of orders to make a prediction about when a new order comes in, mm. whether that one is fraudulent or not. And by the way, that's not an automatic uh, discard of that order. It then goes to a human to right. investigate. Yeah, and whether it's inventory level setting, whether it's vendor lead detection, abusive review detection, counterfeit good detection, all of these kind of things are basically machine learning because you can make use of data from the past to sort of start making predictions about the future. Mm -hmm. And I think if you look at sort of the landscape at this moment, let's say in enterprise and enterprise IT, everyone has access to the same compute capabilities, the same storage, the same 
um, analytics tools, because that's what cloud has given them. It's no longer just the elites that have access to this. Everyone has access mm -hmm. to, to it. So what is then becomes the competitive differentiator is the data that companies sit on. Mm -hmm. yeah, because, and the way that they're going to use that data and how smart they are about it. Now, um, one way you can go about is do traditional analytics. It's basically is building algorithms, humans building algorithms. Or you can make use of machine learning to start to detect patterns that live in that data that you may be using then as a business to be more competitive, to find out new products, to target your customers yeah. better, all of this kind of thing. So I think if you look at, um, there's, I don't know, I saw some statistic, I think CB Insights or something like that showed that one with the number of CEOs and CFOs on their earnings calls actually mentioning machine learning. Mm. And that sort of a massive rise that sort of outweighs big data at all, I think which signals that most organizations understand that it's about their data and smart use of their data to be competitive in the future. Well, the giant tech companies have just an incredible advantage. Uh, someone told me the other day that, you know, it's really the, the big tech companies of China and the U.S. that are, that are going to be the ones that dominate the data era. Well, not the data. I think for us, given that we also we have this cloud platform where basically millions of businesses run on, and each and every one of them can make use of these capabilities. I think there is not a young business that is not making use of machine learning in one way or another. Yeah, Just because they have the ability to start figuring out on day one what kind of data do I need to serve my customers better. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as such, I think it's, it's across the board. It's not just large enterprises, it's young businesses. Um, if you have been in business for a bit longer time, and as such you have information about your customers or about your business processes, yes, you have more data. More data in general means better decision making yeah. because of it. Um, and as such, you know, just make sure your company is alive for a long time enough and you'll have the data <laughs> to, to operate better. So you're in charge of uh, technology for all of Amazon, and we were talking backstage. I can't resist asking you about drones and where, where that stands in terms of, uh, you know, we had cars last week. Uh, are we, are we going to be hearing more about drones at Amazon anytime soon? Well, it's, a, it's an active path that we are pursuing, of course. I mean, um, remember that sort of, if you, sometimes you should think about innovation. You think about things, all the fancy new things, and drones look like that's in that particular bucket, but actually it's not. Sometimes you have to think about innovation, about what are the things that will never change for your customers. Yeah? Uh, size of the, in retail, the size of the catalog, for example, the more products you catalog, the higher the likelihood you can find something, lower pricing will forever be important, anything we can do to drive our own cost picture down so we can help drive pricing down, and convenience. Convenience is a really big driver for customers to select which vendor they will be using. And for many of our customers, they may be in locations where convenience is not possible. However, drones may actually be unlocking this for, for, the, for them. And as such, it is really sort of looking at your complete customer base, not just the ones in New York or in Seattle, mm -hmm. but looking at across the world in all the situations where they are, and what can we do to actually make, give better guarantees on delivery. Yeah, or, uh, and, you know, and drones is one particular path there mm -hmm. for us. Lots of machine learning, though, in that particular case. Because you don't want these drones to be remote controlled. Yeah, because that would mean that their batteries will be out of, will, won't last right. very, very long because the, the radios need to be up. So basically, these drones need to find, their, for a large part, need to find their own way. Mm and they need to do collision avoiding. And so there's all these kind of things, which all is basically machine learning, mm -hmm. uh, coming back to that. Thank you very much. Fascinating conversation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Robert.